Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. Now, today's case is a little bit on the heavier side. We are looking at a severe child abuse case and neglect. And I know that's not for everyone, so if it's not for you, check out some of my other videos. I have something for everybody, true crimey, and not all of them involve children, so you should find something that works for you over on my channel. So let's count this as the warning for today, and let's just all agree that right now is your last chance to pause the video and get out while you can. And for the rest of us, let's jump right into it. I had a bit of a hard time figuring out where to start with this one. It's been tempting to skip right to the end and it's just so hard not to get emotional about this story. We're going to be seeing another one of those cases that there was a missed opportunity again and again, and it kind of just makes you want to scream, especially when there's kids involved. And it gets even harder because the child we're going to be talking about today was just 17 months old. Grasp that. It's a baby, 17 months old. It doesn't get much sadder than that. We're going to be talking about Peter Connolly. He was known as Baby P or Child A for a very long, long time. Actually, until all of the trials involved with this case were all finished. And then his real name was finally released to the public. The other children involved, their names have never been released, but the family requested that Peter's name was made public in the hopes that other people would come forward with their cases or maybe even more information on his to the police. There is a recent update in this case that is why I thought it was the perfect time. Additionally, this case was highly recommended. So thanks to everybody that suggested it. My channel members are amazing. But first, we're going to go quite a way back for this one. I don't usually talk much about the history or the parents or the grandparents in my videos, but I feel like we don't get the whole picture if we don't with this one. It's also going to be pretty hard to talk about how badly social services and child protective services messed up without touching a little on the family history. So that's what we're going to do today, folks. It's sad, but it's also interesting. Peter's family were from Ireland. Peter's great-grandfather was raised in an orphanage. He grew up to be a soldier who regularly beat his daughter, and his daughter was Peter's grandmother, Mary. Mary was only five days old when her mother died and five years old when her sister stepmom died. She was raped by a relative at the age of nine and ran away from home at the age of 13 after getting in a fight with a girl at school and stabbing her with a pair of scissors. Mary said that at that point, she knew she had a choice. It was either a convent school or or prostitution, and she chose the school. Remember, she was only 13. I can't even imagine being 13 years old and having to make such a hard decision. But that was her reality. She married in her early 20s, but it didn't stick and she would later divorce. She then moved around a lot and married her second husband. He was apparently very controlling and he used to beat her too and do things like timing her shopping trips and she would have to ask permission to leave the house. Mary said that one day she just couldn't take it anymore and she stabbed him in the stomach with a knife. Now, 
We know Mary had stabbed her classmate when she was younger, so this was kind of her thing. She said it was self-defense, but she couldn't prove it, and so she ended up with two years of probation for the attack, which is a light sentence, honestly. And this was the house that baby Peter's mom, Tracy, grew up in. We have reports from social services at the time describing the home as unhygienic. Tracy, Peter's mom, and her brother were dirty and unsupervised and that Mary was a drug user and an alcoholic. I'm not telling you all this to excuse or defend Mary or Tracy. I'm mentioning it because these are things that are tracked by social services and should have played a huge part in deciding things we'll see later on the case of Peter. These types of family histories are supposed to be kept in mind when social services and courts decide cases with children still in abusive homes, especially because they tend to lead to more child abuse when a person who has been abused themselves go on to have kids. This does not mean that if you are abused, you will always grow up and abuse your children. Just to be clear, I just want you to know how much much information child services actually had well ignored when it should have saved lives. So back to baby Peter's mom, Tracy. Mary, Tracy's mom, Peter's grandmother, Mary moved Tracy and her half-brother to London after she stabbed her ex-husband in the stomach with a knife. But if Mary was looking for a better life for her and her children, she definitely didn't get one. The other children in the school called Tracy, Tracy the Tramp, because she was always dirty in school that no one wanted to play with her. She was called overweight and kids would make fun of her because her shoes were falling apart and she wore the same dirty clothes. She was known to wear the same tracksuit bottoms every day. And if that wasn't all, Tracy was being physically abused by a close male relative and when she told her mother Mary about this she called her a liar. I can't tell you how frustrating it is when a kid finally gets the courage to say mom somebody's abusing me and the mom says that they're lying like what kid makes that up? At the age of 12 she found out that the man she believed to be her father, the one Mary had stabbed with a knife, well, it wasn't him. Her father was a man Mary had a one-night stand with, a friend of the family who was later convicted of an SA assault, and this had a huge impact on Tracy. She later admitted in court she went a little bit wild after she found out the, the news that the man that she thought was her father was actually not her father. And that gentleman actually did pass away at this point. So she found out her dead father wasn't her father. And the one who was actually her father was basically a rapist. I think I would go on a wild spree too. It's a lot for a child. And her life continued to be chaotic until she was picked up by social services and removed from the home. They sent her to a boarding school for children with special education needs and behavioral and social problems. And she did well. I mean, she passed several GCSEs or OWLS for you Harry Potter fans out there. And she left at the age of 16. This isn't unusual in the UK for comprehensive schools to finish at 16 and then students apply and they're able to go to colleges. And from the age of 16 and 18, then they go to university. But what is more than a little bit unusual is that in Tracy's case is that she then met and married a 33-year-old railway worker from Ireland. So a man 17 years older than her. They had three girls together and then they had baby Peter. 
Peter Connolly, who was born on March 1st, 2006, and he was just three months old when his father filed for divorce. There had been problems in the marriage. Her ex-husband blaming Tracy for not doing her share of housework or helping look after the kids. And he said that she was flirting with other men on the internet chat rooms. She was also diagnosed as having depression during this period as well, but none of this stopped her from from looking for love again. And she found it three months after her divorce with a man named Stephen. Stephen Barker, who was 32 at the time, and he was doing some maintenance on one of Tracy's friend's house. And Tracy liked what she saw. Ugh. God, it makes me just want to puke in my mouth a little bit. He was a replica, I'm telling you, a replica of all the terrible men in her family tree. It's just gross. Stephen was more than a bit of a bad boy. He'd also gone to school for special needs growing up and scored around 60 on his IQ test. He liked knives and martial arts and crossbows, and he had a collection of swastikas. A real winner, this one. He liked to walk around his home dressed up in combat gear and was already in trouble with the law for abusing animals. Abusing animals to the point that the law needed to get involved? You know it was bad. I would like to say that that was it, but unfortunately it gets much worse than that. Stephen and his older brother Jason, they had actually been in very serious trouble with the law already. They had been charged with torturing their own grandmother, Hilda Barker. They were trying to get her to change her will, but she died of pneumonia before the case went to court, so it was dismissed, and they actually got away with it. Torturing their own grandmother complete degenerates, horrible people. And I have no idea why, but Tracy liked this guy. He moved in with her and her four children. She had three daughters and then she had Peter, so four children. He moved in with his two dogs. The same man that liked torturing animals had two dogs. That's scary. This was in November of 2006. In December, one month later, December 2006, so less than a month later, a doctor spotted severe bruising on Peter and Tracy was arrested. Peter was removed from the home and sent to live with a family friend. But the police were unable to find enough evidence to charge Tracy with anything. And so she was set free and Peter was sent back to his abusers after only a couple of weeks. Peter back in the home by January. The next month, February, a former social worker and whistleblower sent a letter to the Department of Health to voice her concerns over the failings of Child Protective Services, and she actually singled out the office that was in charge of Peter's case. She met with them to discuss this letter in March, and Peter was admitted to the hospital with two black eyes and swelling on the left side of his head in April. In May, a social worker found Peter with bruises and scratch marks on 12 different parts of his body and Tracy was rearrested. Somehow, don't ask me how, somehow nothing came of this and Peter was actually sent back to the home. I noticed just something on Peter's face, the lighting wasn't too good in in the room and I kind of asked Tracy about Peter's face and as Peter got up and started walking around um, Tracy had said that he had um, a squabble with her friend's child and 
her friend's child had hit him in the face with a particular toy. In June, now it is where it gets terrible. In June, Stephen's older brother, Jason, moved into the house. Do you guys remember me talking about Jason, his past of torturing his grandmother? Well, now he is moving into the house with his four children and his 15-year-old girlfriend into the house with them. 15! So now he's moving in with his brother and his brother's new family because he needed somewhere to hide from the police because with his 15-year-old girlfriend, just sick. But anyways, he was running from the law because he had this 15-year-old girlfriend, just sick. At this point, uh, Stephen's brother, Jason, changed his name to Jason Owen. But I just wish that he would have changed other things. Jason was said to be a bad influence on Stephen, but it's questionable on who influenced who. They were both pretty evil. Nevertheless, this just got worse for Peter. Jason later bragged while he was on bail for for Peter's case. He's bragging to a friend that he tortured someone and it just went too far. That someone was a 17-month-old baby. In June, a social worker found bruises on Peter and reported them to the police. Peter underwent a medical examination that considered he'd gotten the bruises from child abuse. He was removed from the home on June 4th and sent to live with a family friend. But on July 25th, the Herringee Council's Children and Youth People Services were advised that they did not have enough evidence of abuse to legally remove Peter from the home and he was again sent back. On July 30th, a social worker missed some injuries on Peter's face and hands because Tracy, Stephen, and Jason had smeared chocolate all over him to cover them up. But they couldn't do the same thing for his appointment, which was with a pediatrician the next day. I wish I could say that this was where they were finally caught. But unfortunately, no. At this point, Peter had visible bruises of different stages and ages on his body and his back and infections to his ears, scalp, his index finger where a finger had been sliced with a knife and he was missing a nail. This really should have been a turning point in this case and this case would have been handled so much differently and a report on how this case was handled was made by one of the county's top pediatricians after the fact. In June there was a change in mum's behavior. Peter's presentation, how he looks, changes and his weight goes down as does a sibling's weight go down it so it looks as if in those two months something different is happening in this household when i asked social care what happened in june why did certain things not happen the response was that at that point in time that area was inundated and other cases seemed high priority. It would say that Peter's pediatrician should have alerted social services after the visit. She had enough physical evidence to make a report, especially because Peter was on the Child Protective Register already. But Peter's pediatrician was only actually working there as a stand-in because of the lack of funding and the lack of qualified doctors that work in that field. She had limited experience and training in child protection and Peter was grumpy. She put off doing a full examination, noting that Peter was miserable and cranky and that she didn't want to upset him further. On some level, you can understand that, but wow. But I just wish she would have taken it a little bit more seriously because if she had done a full examination, she would have found that Peter had eight broken ribs a snapped spine. Of course he was cranky. Just let that sink in for a moment. 
Two days later, so on August 3rd, 2007, Peter was found dead in his bed. First responders found him wearing only a diaper. His face, skin, lips were blue, and he wasn't breathing. They tried to resuscitate him, but they couldn't get him back, and he was later pronounced dead at the hospital. The doctor that could have saved him was let go from her position, and she actually had to move without her family back to her home country to avoid all the scrutiny. And I mean, she was getting death threats, like it was not good for her. So she actually fled. I don't know where she's at now, but at the time, that's what she did. So what happened to Peter? An autopsy found all of the previous injuries that I mentioned, the social worker and doctors had missed, and it found that he had been beaten Peter had been hit on the side of his head so hard that it knocked out a tooth. He'd swallowed it, and it was believed that this is the blow that caused his death. Reports on this differ, though, so it, uh, but we can for sure say it was homicide with a spinal injury causing internal bleeding. A post-mortem revealed he had swallowed a tooth after being punched, as well as severe bruising in different stages of healing all over his body, a broken back, broken ribs, mutilated fingertips, as well as missing fingernails. Peter had suffered severe abuse by those sadistic monsters. Tracy, Stephen, and Jason were all arrested. Tracy pretty quickly pled guilty to causing or allowing the death of a child or a vulnerable person, but the prosecution wanted to pin both Stephen and Jason with the murder as well. They tried, but a jury found them not guilty because of insufficient evidence, and they were both found guilty on the same charge as Tracy, which is causing or allowing death of a child or a vulnerable person. The trial couldn't go on to sentencing, though, because it wasn't over for the three of them. There was still one more terrible trial to come. In April of 2009, Tracy and Stephen went to court again to face charges related to the rape of a two-year-old girl. Tracy was facing child cruelty charges for Peter and Stephen for rape. There were strict gag orders concerning the identities of the children involved, which was why Peter was still referenced as Baby P or Child A until the end of this trial, and then the identity of the two-year-old was never revealed. Their defense lawyers argued that the jury had already been influenced by all the media information available on the internet regarding Peter's case, but the trial went ahead anyways. Tracy was found not guilty for murder, but Stephen was found guilty of the rape of the two-year-old. A baby. Like, how, what? These two trials were sentenced together in May of 2009 for Stephen. Tracy was sentenced to indefinite imprisonment for public protection. But before you get excited, she had a minimum of five years, then was eligible for parole. So although she got a life term, she's eligible for for parole after five years. This meant that she would be evaluated after this five years and only released if there was no longer deemed to be a risk to the public and in particular, this case, small children. Jason was also sentenced to indefinite imprisonment with a minimum three-year term for his part in Peter's death. And Stephen, Stephen was sentenced to life for the rape of the two-year-old with a minimum of, of 10-year term and 12 years for the part of the murder in Peter. This sentence was ran concurrently with the two-year-old case, so he's actually really only serving a sentence for the little girl. I, I just don't understand the UK system sometimes. I don't understand the U.S. system either, if I'm being completely honest, but why can, why is it concurrent? Like, it's too 
horrible child cases and they're like, oh, we'll just run them together. Why? Why? I don't even know why that's even a thing. But anyways, Jason's sentence was actually later changed to a fixed six-year term, and he was released in August of 2011. The latest report that I could find on Jason was from 2015. He was apparently working as a fitness and life coach at a gym after he changed his name again, and he grew a beard. What kind of life coach is Jason? What kind of life advice is Jason handing out? That's what I want to know. Who knows where he is now, but I just hope it's nowhere nice. Tracy was released in 2013. I know, do the math, right? But she did end up back in prison. She was found guilty of violating her parole and sending indecent photos of herself to people who were into her and her newfound murderous fame. She tried three more times to be released, but wasn't. But the most recent news is that the courts granted her request for parole on March 30th, 2022, although a release date has not been immediately set. It could be by time you're watching this, but I'm going to ask you this question. Should Tracy be a free woman after 15 years? Do you want her walking your streets? You tell me. Steven keeps getting denied parole every time he goes for it. The board found out that he refuses to, to work with treatment programs and he hasn't been able to confront his violent and sexual tendencies. He is still listed as a risk to children and to the public for his capacity to become aroused every time he's around a young child and he's listed as incapable of controlling his extreme emotions. In layman terms, he is a sick piece of Steven is right where he should be. He should never get out. I'd give up if I were you, Steven. Just stay there. But that's not all that happened after Peter's death. Going back to April 2009, so now right before the trials, the social worker and the three managers that were involved in Peter's case were dismissed in July. The office in charge of the case went under a huge inspection. The report was made on the office was just shocking. His death was blamed on the social workers and shattered our confidence in the profession's ability to protect children. I can't believe they didn't force it. They must go. Yes. All those are responsible have to I go. Just, I'd sack, sack them all, mate. And put them all in the big field and burn them. Let's be honest, this is a story about a 17-year-old girl who had no idea how to bring up a child. It's about a boyfriend who couldn't read but could beat a child. And it's about a social services department that gets £100 million a year and can't look after children. Peter was in contact with different authorities over 60 times in eight months leading up to his death. Just wrap your brain around that 60 times. If we do the math, in eight months, they were contacted 60 times. He was only 17 months old when he passed. I mean, he's a baby. And the office in charge of his case was found to have made only a limited amount in progress to try to tackle the problems that had led to little Peter's death. On several occasions, we wept together just reading some of the things that we were being told were happening to that little boy and we were we were just quite horrified by it the child was so vulnerable and we missed it all of us the police the social workers the health people all of the all of those health agencies you could just go through it again and again if only this, if only that. Yeah, we missed it. First up, the history of child abuse that they were able to track back for generations should have played a bigger part in determining whether Peter and his sisters, who were also on the child protection register, should have been allowed to stay in the home with Tracy. Peter's grandmother, Mary, 
openly admitted that she had a problem with violence, especially towards men. She said she started to beat her own son when he was only six weeks old. And by the time he was three, he'd already been admitted to the hospital four times. The reports we have from Tracy's childhood and the ones made about Peter are just eerily similar. This should have raised huge red flags and should have been addressed by Child Protective Services a lot sooner. The report on the office said, Too little significance was given to Tracy's childhood experience of serious physical and emotional abuse and the possible impact of it on her parenting. The office was also criticized for being too willing to believe Tracy's version of what happened to Peter. The report said there was a willingness to believe Tracy's account, her care of her children, how she ran her household, and the nature of her friendship networks. It's also not too hard to figure out how this was possible. We know that Tracy had been in contact with social services as a child, and it isn't too far of a stretch that Tracy had learned the right things to say from watching her own mother deal with them and being on the other side of it too. I just wish they would have focused more on what they were actually seeing over what she was saying, especially because Stephen was in the house almost every time they went there, and they actually believed Tracy when she said he was just visiting. I know, that's pretty shocking. It actually turns out that the office in charge of Peter's case never figured out that Stephen was living in the home. Forget about the older brother Jason and his four kids and his 15-year-old girlfriend that were living there as well. The office admitted that they had no idea how much influence Stephen had on looking after Tracy's children. And I mean, it's a lot. I don't like having people interfering with the time. I know, I don't mean that in a horrible way. I know that the social workers are there for a job. I know they're there for a purpose. And at the end of all this, I hope they will back off and leave me alone and see that I am an okay mother. Tracy you know, admitted that she spent most of her days on the internet watching porn and getting drunk. Stephen was actually the one who looked after the children the most Peter's biological father made several complaints and reports to Child Protective Services about the state of his children, asking them to please, please go check on my children and seek medical attention for them, especially Peter. His father had actually noticed those infections on Peter's scalp and skin and had told Child Protective Services about them. But we now know what they did about these reports. The inspection of the office didn't only criticize them, though. The report said Peter's horrifying death could and should have been prevented if the correct approach had been taken at the first serious incident. It also raised concern over Peter's pediatrician, saying that they never should have believed the stories Tracy made up to excuse, to excuse his injuries, such stories as him falling down or he got bit by a dog. It also said that the police should have investigated reports more seriously, especially after they had found suspicious injuries on the children. And it said that the teachers in the school of Peter's sisters, you know, he had three sisters that were in school. Well, these teachers should have noticed something. They should have been more active in reporting problems that had, you know, been going on in Tracy's house to authorities. But that is it for this case. I know it's a rough way to end it. I'm going to really struggle to wrap this one up. I just, I just feel like there's so many missed opportunities. Again, this is just one of those cases where there were failures every level and every opportunity. And I feel like we've been seeing so many of these cases that it should have and could have been avoided. The author of the report that I got a lot of information from this case from summed up the situation like this. If Peter Connolly is to have any legacy at all, it's that children are safer. 
Are they, though? Rest in peace, Star and Arthur. I really hope and I want to believe that is true. Authorities have had a lot of time to address the problems found in the report and the ones that led up to Peter's death. I just hope that they've taken care of them so more children don't end up in getting hurt like Peter and his sisters did. Of course, everyone's human and there are going to be mistakes in those cases that just slip through the cracks. But authorities have to get better at recognizing signs and actually using the information they have available to stop abuse going from generation to generation. But what do you guys think? Do you think that the report addressed all the problems here or the case of this case or do you think that they or do you think that something was missed and what do you think they could do better to help stop cases like this from happening let me know in the comment section down below i'd love to hear your thoughts and get a discussion going sharing is important because who knows maybe someone will see something and get an idea that they could actually help and save lives but we should for sure leave a blue heart for baby p peter Connolly, and his surviving family But I want to thank all of you for stopping by the channel today. It was a tough case. And if you made it to the end, you guys are rock stars. And I love you to death. A big warm shout out to my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. I'm sending you love. Can you feel it? If you'd like to become a channel member too, remember you can do so by joining on your desktop or by clicking the link in the description. And if you want to do it on your phone, there's a little video in the description on how to do it. There are more stories in my crimey stories playlist if you'd like to check them out. Stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. Bye.